Welcome everyone joining. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to step off the stage and go ahead and hand things over to uh, Audrey Moore. Thank you, Cole. And welcome, everybody. It's really nice to have everybody here today. We're looking forward to sharing everything. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the presentation. Our agenda today, we'll do a welcome and introduction. We'll have everyone who's been involved on the YP2LE side of uh, creating the dashboards and getting it to where they are today, introduce themselves. We'll do a quick uh, overview of the activity itself and talk about the methods that were used to collect the information. But the bulk of our webinar today will be to actually talk about the survey, its findings, implications, and share the actual dashboards that have been created. And then we'll spend some time uh, during a Q&A session, followed by the conclusion. Um, I'm Audrey Moore. I am a, the Senior Technical Advisor for Task 1, which is the PYD Learning Agenda. And I'm going to pass it to Christy Scott to introduce herself. Great. Good morning. Thanks, Audrey, for the introduction. I am Christy Scott. I am the Project Director for YP2LE. And we are super excited to be launching the dashboard, the Civic Engagement Dashboard and Snapshots this morning. Um, this has been quite an undertaking. There are some really great results. Sorry, I have a small kitty jumping on the camera. Um, so we are really excited to be at this point where we can launch this dashboard on the Youth Power platform. So um, I don't want to take too much time. We are super excited to get this going forward. And I'm going to hand it over to Nancy, just um, our, our COR, to give a few words. And then we'll um, continue with the agenda. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Christy. Uh, I'm not going to take up too much time either, but yeah, I'm Nancy Taggart. I'm the, the COR for Youth Power 2 Learning and Evaluation, the contract under which this uh, initiative has been supported. I'm very pleased to have invested in this uh, with the urging of my, my close colleagues in the DRG Center and our agency youth coordinator, Mike McCabe. I think we're all really delighted to have supported this uh, dashboard creation, um, given how important youth civic engagement is for the youth space, but also we're seeing it more and more in our integrated youth activities at USAID linked to workforce development programming, as well as other sectors. So we have a lot to learn, um, but I think uh, this is a, a good uh, first step or a step among many that are helping us to shed some light on what influences young people uh, in their decisions about political participation uh, and, and what are some of the factors that play into young people's uh, civic engagement. So very important and I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, the findings being summarized today and introducing you to the, the dashboard and, and the discussion. So I welcome your, your questions uh, and, and the discussion today. Uh, before I hand it over to Chelsea, I just wanted to thank so much uh, everyone uh, who contributed to this. Um, we're going to hear from everybody today, but uh, Premise, Mathematica, of course, Making Sense, um, Hilda, our Youth Research Advisor and Restless Development, uh, and of course, our colleagues within the DRG Center. So thank you all so much and um, look forward to the discussion. Uh, Chelsea, I hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Nancy and Christy, for that warm welcome, um, and Audrey for the overview of our agenda. So I'm going to um, turn it over to our activity manager at USA DRG for this activity, and this is a senior advisor for youth um, civic education and engagement at USA, uh, Nita Tanjarala, who's going to give us a little bit of an overview of the activity. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chelsea and Christy and Nancy. You know, the DRG Center at USA was delighted to collaborate with our colleagues in the Center for Ed and YP2LE partners to support the design, implementation, and launch of uh, this Youth Civic Engagement Country Snapshots. We are eager to learn more about youth civic engagement with a specific focus on how particular motivations and barriers impact civic and political action and behaviors. Um, sorry, motivations and barriers. Um, with 65% of the global population under the age of 35, it's vital that governments, donors, civil society, schools, communities take steps to ensure that young people are engaged and encouraged to be a, uh, to be a part of both the response to crises and broader democratic participation. 
The snapshots we hope provide an opportunity to measure youth knowledge and attitudes, including primary sources of civic knowledge, trust in government, voting, participation in civil society, and volunteering. Results from the survey provide insights on youth civic engagement that we hope will help partners and other stakeholders design more effective and responsive youth programming. So we're looking really forward to, to diving more into the findings and taking your wonderful questions later on. Over to you, Audrey. So the objectives of the actual snapshots was to learn more about youth civic engagement through a crowdsourcing methodology. We targeted 10 priority countries for the DRG and we measured youth knowledge, attitudes, behaviors, sources of civic knowledge and trust, voting behaviors across these groups of youth. Uh, the data are disaggregated by age and gender. And we also took the opportunity to implement what's called a priming experiment, which means we looked at how different motivations related to conflict and violence and e the economy and how priming participants uh, before giving them the civic engagement questions affected their responses to those questions. And then the activity created the dashboard, which we'll be launching with you all today. Next slide. So this youth activity falls under the YP2LE learning agenda. As many of you know, the positive youth uh, development agenda is um, builds on the findings of a systematic review that was done several years ago, uh, looking at how positive youth development programs can create impacts and affect youth in low and middle income countries. And we have this learning agenda under YP2LE that highlights a series of gaps uh, on different topics including um, we're looking to understand how PYD programs affect positive impacts. We're looking at PYD and their link to vulnerable and marginalized populations, youth engagement, how the cross-sectoral nature of PYD programs can contribute to youth outcomes. And we also are looking for different ways to measure PYD constructs. And so this activity specifically contributes to this uh, learning agenda theme of measurement in PYD constructs. And it particularly contributes to our understanding of youth contribution to their communities uh, and as well as the enabling environment uh, and how that allows youth to engage in the political process and the civic engagement process. It also contributes to youth engagement because it helps us to get at least a snapshot of how youth are civically engaging in their communities and what uh, meaningful civic engagement means to them. Next slide. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to my colleague, Sarah Hughes, and she's gonna go over the methodology for the activity. Sarah? Thanks, Audrey. So the activity was, uh, was largely based on developing and running a survey. So I'm gonna speak just briefly about the methodology of the survey. So the way that we designed the survey questionnaire was first we identified a number of validated surveys that had similar domains, that means subjects that, and topics that we were interested in studying and that aligned with the positive youth development agenda and that could help us answer questions about how youth are thinking about civic engagement. So we reviewed a number of surveys for items, that's questions and response options that measure what we want to measure and what we plan to measure. We then adapted the number and the length of the questions so they would be appropriate for a web survey and also for youth respondents. So there we had to adapt some questionnaires that may have been fielded in person, face to face. Instead, this one was on a web survey and the respondents, the people who are answering were not uh, sort of a general population all the way to elderly adults or for children, but rather youth respondents between the ages of 18 and 35. We then uh, went through some efforts to validate the questionnaire, and we'll talk about that in, uh, in a minute, how we sort of tested the questions with a, a group of youth respondents. And then the, the questionnaire was fielded or sent out to a sample, a number of people from a crowdsourcing platform that my colleague Jenny will be talking about in just a moment, Jenny from Premise. 
Uh, and the sample uh, uh, used a crowdsourcing platform and they had incentives that were applied. In other words, they were paid a small amount to complete the survey. This is a non-representative sample. That doesn't mean that it's a bad sample. It just means that you can't generalize many of the responses to a much larger population or to a population that differs from the people who actually answered. And the case study was carried out in 10 countries with about 770 respondents per country. Next slide. I'll mention just briefly some of the domains and subdomains and topics that we included in the study. There are a number of positive youth domains, including youth agency, youth contribution, enabling environment uh, that we focused on as we gathered together surveys and questionnaires, uh, and then examined what domains and subdomains and topics were included. Uh, we tried to use as much as possible uh, surveys and questionnaires that had been fielded in a number of different countries in various uh, uh, languages and that had been fielded a number of times so that we could use questions that had been used elsewhere. Uh, that's sort of a, 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 best, a best practice in survey methodology. So we, some of the topics that were covered were included altruism, community improvement, democracy, influence, and sources of information. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Chris, to, uh, from USAID, Chris Grady, to discuss the priming experiment that was included here. Thank you, Sarah. Before I give details about the priming experiment, let me tell you what we wanted to learn from doing it. Youth programs often want to motivate young people to participate in their community and in politics. And these programs make assumptions about what motivates youth to participate and what prevents youth from participating. Two of the main assumptions are, first, that youth are motivated to engage civically by the possibility of gaining employment and improving their economic well-being. And second, that the youth may be motivated to ensure peace and may be deterred from engagement due to conflict and violence. We wanted to test these assumptions. We wanted to know if what we think motivates and deters youth really does motivate and deter youth. We used a survey experiment instead of asking respondents what motivates you for a couple of reasons. First, that question has already been asked in a lot of qualitative in-person studies, and that type of question makes more sense to ask in person when the enumerator and respondent can have a conversation. And as Sarah said, this survey was going to be done online. And second, people are not always consciously aware of the things that influence their behavior. And so a priming experiment can help us understand what factors unconsciously motivate a person. So here's how a priming experiment works. We make respondents think about one thing, and we see how thinking about that thing affects their survey responses about other things. So in our case, we primed some respondents to think about economic concerns or conflict concerns. And then we asked some questions about civic engagement to see if thinking about economic concerns or conflict concerns changed how they plan to engage civically and their attitudes toward civic engagement. So basically, we asked respondents things like, do you plan to vote in the next election? And do you plan to volunteer for a community organization this year? But before we asked those questions, we asked some respondents about their economic situation or their community's conflict situation. We could then see how respondents primed to think about economics or conflict differ from respondents not primed to think about economics or conflict. So that's the priming experiment. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Sarah to tell you all about the youth validation workshops. I'm going to just check and see if our youth advisor, Hilda, is able to, to speak, uh, uh, to talk about the youth validation workshop. So let me just give it one second. Hilda, are you available? Okay, I think Hilda is, is working in an area with low internet capacity, and so uh, I'll go ahead and, and um, I'll get to steal her thunder in a way. So one of the methods we use to validate the questionnaire, so validating the questionnaire means uh, sort of checking to make sure that indeed we are measuring what we think we're measuring. Um, there's no survey that's perfect, uh, but you do your best to, to uh, double check that the questions are measuring what they're measuring. And how do you do that? Well, one way you can do that is to carry, a, carry out a focus group essentially. So what we did is we carried out a validation workshop over Zoom it was essentially a remote focus group. And we invited respondents from target countries, that is the countries that would be included in the survey, uh, up to 10. We selected certain questions for validation. There are about 25 questions in the survey and uh, 25 questions is a few too many for an hour or an hour and a half long validation workshop. So we selected certain questions that we thought might be a little complicated or where we weren't 
entirely certain that they were measuring what we thought they were measuring, or we had some questions about the response options, maybe not just the question, but the response options. And so we selected several questions for validation. Some of these were new questions uh, that had not been validated in other surveys that we needed to ask for this questionnaire. So we carried out the validation workshop. Hilda uh, was a crucial member of the team, which is why we were hoping she'd be able to talk a little bit about it today. Um, uh, we uh, asked questions, at, had each respondent all the respondents read the question, because this is a web survey, they would be reading the question. All the respondents would read the question and read the response options. Then we asked them how they formulated their answers and uh, double check to see that indeed these questions were measuring what we thought they were measuring. We also opened the floor to suggestions on how to improve the question or how to improve the response options. We used verbal and nonverbal, that is facial cues in Zoom for those who were visible on the screen to understand when folks were confused. Uh, and this allowed us to mix, ad, adapt a few of the questions and some of the response options before fielding the survey. Next slide. So the next activity um, or the next uh, task then was that we launched the survey. So again, this is a sample of youth who have smartphones. So not an entirely, not a nationally representative survey, but youth who have smartphones. They were recruited to participate in surveys on various topics, and Jenny will be talking about that in a moment. And they uh, did receive incentives to participate. Uh, I will turn it over to, um, to Jenny Shapiro from Premise to discuss a little bit more about the data collection. Jenny? So yes, I, I talk a little bit about how the surveys were carried out on the Premise platform. Premise is a real-time data collection and analytics software product, and we were able to partner with YP2LE uh, to carry out the data collection activities. Um, Premise was able to leverage its existing network of citizen data collectors, and so once the surveys were designed and validated, um, we were able to program them onto our platform, um, and they were made available to youth participants in the 10 designated countries via the Premise mobile app. Um, and we are also able to randomize, uh, randomly sort male and female respondents into three separate groups. So two treatment groups for the priming experiment and one control group. Um, and each group received a different version of the survey, which they completed via the, the Premise mobile application. Um, and we aim to have about 130 submissions for each of these groups, so 130 um, male submissions for group A, female submissions for group A, and the same for group B and the control group, group C. Um, as was mentioned, um, it's standard practice on the premise platform um, to provide incentives for um, research participants and our, our data collectors. Um, so the YP2LE research participants were incentivized using a micropayment model. Um, and this was adjusted as necessary across different countries and gender groups, depending on the relative ease of, of response collection um, in, in the various locations. Um, also, as is mentioned, um, smartphone ownership is a requirement to access the premise platform. Um, so that can just give some sort of indication about the relative demographics or socioeconomic status of some of these participants. Um, so again, not a representative sample, but still a snapshot of how youth are feeling across these 10 selected countries. Um, so Premise also provided the translation and localization services uh, for the necessary supported languages, and that included Armenian, Turkish, Russian, Serbian, and Hark, French, Spanish, Bengali, and Arabic. Um, and our translators are part of our global workforce. Um, and they are they are native speakers of the language and are also from um, locations where that's the primary language spoken. Um, and premise translators really strive to maintain natural sounding language, and that's to ensure that all survey information makes sense in the local context. Um, but uh, there's also an effort made to um, how to um, ensure fidelity across all instruments, uh, across the instrument, across all different translations. Um, and uh, so it, we also employed proofreaders as well. Um, so there is secondary um, efforts made to look over these translations um, and uh, any, uh, any um, differences in between the, the primary translator and the proofreader um, were adjudicated 
and uh, there's also that opportunity for YP2LE partners to look over the translations if that was um, if they had a local speaker on staff to be able to, to check that over. Um, after the workshops, the youth validation workshops were conducted, uh, Premis was also able to update the instrument based on feedback from the focus groups, uh, discussions that were conducted with the youth in the selected countries, um, and we were able to update the surveys accordingly to ensure that we had um, kind of the, the most uh, validated version of each instrument. Um, and then a note on fraud prevention and data quality insurance. Each YP2LE survey submission was subjected to automated quality control. That's pretty standard on the step premise platform. Um, and that meant that each submission was reviewed for um, the use of GPS emulators or mock GPS so that we could ensure that <clears throat> contributors were in um, the correct location when they were responding, that they spent an appropriate time on the survey. Um, there was no button smashing meaning or, or pattern matching, meaning contributors weren't just um, you know, selecting the first uh, response option, um, and that uh, we were also checking for multiple accounts. So one submission, one account, one person. Um, if any surveys were found to be in violation um, of any of these kind of uh, various fraud filters, they were removed from the data set. And if any survey participants were found to be in violation of the premise terms of service, uh, their account was suspended and their submissions were removed from the, the data set and the dashboard. Um, so that's those are the processes that we put in place to ensure data integrity and, and quality insurance for the data that's being represented on the dashboard today. So now I'll turn it back over to my, uh, our colleagues to discuss some of the findings and implications of the surveys. So um, just briefly, the, the total sample size was over 7,000 uh, over 7,000 respondents, and those were split about evenly between male and female. So just to, to talk a little bit, uh, I, I believe now we're going to be turning over to the, um, to the dashboards, and I believe that uh, Maria will be speaking. Yes. Um, thank you. So I'm Maria Brindlemeyer. I'm the Senior Knowledge Management Specialist with uh, Youth Power 2 Learning and Evaluation. And I'm going to just switch over to our uh, uh, website. And uh, I'm going to focus on how you can get to the um, dashboard and also talk a little bit about how to navigate through the dashboard and then uh, my colleagues will be talking about the findings. So this is youthpower.org, uh, the website. And uh, when you scroll down just a little bit, you will see that the snapshot is right here on the homepage, so you can always find it. But uh, you can also find it under the resources here, where we have all the key toolkits and other things. and so. This last item here, dashboard, you, um, the last item on the um, navigation is the, the new uh, dashboard that is, uh, that is listed. So once you are there, you will then, um, let me go directly to the dashboard. So this is the page that you will see as it's opening up. Um, and it gives you a little bit of the background of uh, how the research was done, um, the uh, uh, a broad analysis, and then uh, also how to use the dashboard and the dashboard limitations. So these are important things to read before you start reading it. Uh, using it, and you'll hear a little bit more about it today. And then the most important thing in terms of getting through the dashboard is uh, the navigation here. So you can see that there are different uh, pages and different dashboards that you can access. So on the dashboard home, you will get some of the main responses about the perceptions and the behaviors. And uh, the nice thing is, so you will see the, uh, the graphics here directly on the website, but then you can also move through it and filter. So you can filter by country, by gender. Uh, and so those are different ways in which you can really look at the content in a very flexible way. 
And then uh, the nice thing is also that you can download the data. Uh, and so you'll get an Excel spreadsheet and then you'll be able to manipulate the data uh, in a way that makes uh, most sense for you. So I will just quickly um, click through the different uh, pages that are there. So in terms of the navigation, uh, here's the civic knowledge and norms uh, page. And again, you can filter by country, gender, education, and financial status. Uh, there is the past and future behavior, the trust in the institutions. They are all kind of very similar the, in terms of the look and how to nav you navigate to them, the political efficacy and interest. And I'll click on this one, the conflict and economic motivations, because as uh, my colleagues said earlier, uh, this is the one that is based on the priming and where uh, the uh, uh, interest was in identifying if priming questions actually uh, uh, impacted the results. And my colleagues will talk about that. And then the uh, data can be downloaded here. So uh, when you click on that, you'll just get that spreadsheet and then you can navigate through it. And then we can hand this over to, to Sarah uh, Hughes again, mm -hmm. um, who can speak more about um, some of the findings from the survey activities and, and the implications of the findings as well. Okay. So um, for all the participants, so you've seen this tantalizing view of the dashboards, and I'm wondering how many of you, you can go ahead and raise your hand. I know we can't see you, but um, raise your hand if you've already gone over to the dashboards and started fiddling around with them. Um, I encourage everyone to, to take a look at them, but I'm going to talk about a few interesting survey findings. I see uh, Brian Hoft had said, yep, um, sure enough. So just here, I'm going to talk about just a few top level survey findings, a few things that we found as we have been sort of trolling through the data and, and, and scrolling through the data and looking at it to see what kind of interesting things we found. So I'm just going to mention a few things, um, and these are perhaps not of most interest to you. A few people may be particularly interested in them, but I do encourage everyone to take a look at the dashboards. So one of the things we asked about was how likely a respondent, and this is uh, how likely a respondent feels that they can influence local government decisions. So situate yourself uh, in the role of a respondent, someone who's answering the survey, and the question is how likely is it that you can influence local government decisions? And what we found, and then you need to answer between on a scale from not at all can't influence local government decisions at all to a lot. I can really influence local government decisions. And if you look at the slide on the left, you'll see that, look at the bottom bar there, all, you'll see that overall, people sort of thought, well, not a whole lot. You know, yes, somewhat, but not a lot. I can't really influence local government decisions a lot. And you'll see in the blue lines above that, uh, that for responded to identify as male and responded to identify as female, there is some difference that male respondents or those who re identify as male responded with a bit more perhaps confidence that they can influence local government decisions. And then if you look at the slide on the right, another thing that we found, uh, we looked at, at uh, you can break down and you, all of this, you can look at all this yourselves on the, on the dashboards. So now I know half the audience has gone off to the dashboards, but those of you who are left, um, if, you, if you'd like to know how likely is it that you can influence local government decisions? Well, you'll see that there is a little bit of a difference here at the younger cohorts, uh, as you look at the slide there, the 20 to 24s, the 18 to 19 year olds, appear to think perhaps they have a little bit more influence uh, than some of the older um, folks. And there are a lot of potential reasons for that. This is just a survey. We didn't ask a qualitative question as why do you think that? Uh, but there are certainly some hypotheses or some ideas that we could propose that perhaps older people feel they have more, more to lose. Perhaps they're too busy with family formation, with work and so on uh, to, to feel that they have time to try to influence local government decisions. Let's go on to the next slide. We have just a few top line survey findings here. Another question we asked was during the past year, again, put yourself in the position of being the one who's answering the question. During the past year, how often have you contacted a local government official to give them your views? So we just, we asked a question about 
uh, how much you feel that you can influence go local government officials. Well, how often have you actually contacted a local government official to give them your views? And you'll see, again, uh, it's between never and often, it's closer to never than it is to often. And you see that there is some difference and perhaps a substantial difference between respondents who identify as male and respondents who identify as female. Uh, and again, by age, the younger cohorts seem to have con or stated that they have contacted local government officials to give them their views perhaps a bit more often. All right, let's go on to the next slide, please. Another question we asked, now here it has to do with how much do you feel that you can contribute to change in your community? So really sort of a personal efficacy question uh, and, and a bit about optimism. You know, do you feel that you can uh, contribute to change in your community? So the way that the question is phrased is can people like you generally contribute to change in your community if they want? And here we see that actually folks are fairly optimistic. The range was from no, not at all to yes, very easily. And you'll see that the, the, the mean is, is rather high. It's above 50%. So they're more on the side of yes, more easily. Yes, I, I can, or people like me can con generally contribute to change in my community if we want to. And again, we see that the younger, uh, the younger cohort may be a bit more optimistic, but not substantially so uh, than, than a somewhat older uh, group. Next slide. Another uh, question that we asked was how supportive is your community of young people participating in local politics? And here we found it sort of right in the middle of the road. Oh, sorry, there's a label missing here, but from not so much to a lot. And there's sort of middle of the road. Yeah, perhaps supportive, perhaps, you know, somewhat supportive. Next slide. And then we have a, a number of other questions. Again, go to the dashboards. You'll see there's lots of interesting questions in there and the questionnaire is available in there as well. Um, did you vote in the last election? And here we see overall that about 45% said yes, 41% said no, and then some said they couldn't recall. I can't recall might be a soft refusal to respond, to respond but we're not sure. And then when asked uh, by gender, we see that the breakdown is fairly similar. There is some difference that female, uh, uh, those who, who identify as female, responded a bit more uh, that yes, I did vote 47% to 43% for those who identify as male. And then the final survey finding slide, I believe is the next one. And so we asked about groups that influence or, or uh, what information and, and groups that influence uh, opinion on social and political issues and found that relatives outweigh all others. Relatives and then friends have an influence on respondents' opinions on social and political uh, concerns and issues. So those are just a few of the top line findings. And again, I encourage everyone to go to the dashboards and fiddle around, take a look at individual countries. You can select on countries, you can select on age groups, you can select on gender. Um, there are a lot of different ways that you can look at the data. Uh, and, but what I'm going to do now is turn it over to my colleague, Audrey from Mathematica to talk a little bit about what are some of the implications of the survey findings, Audrey? Thanks, Sarah. Okay, next slide. So I wanna briefly just talk a little bit about how the results of these surveys um, can be used and the implications for different stakeholder groups, keeping in mind you know, what Sarah had said that this is not a representative survey in these countries. This was crowdsourced. It was done with a group of youth that had access to cell phones. There were a number of criteria that um, the youth had to meet in order to respond. But with the snapshot, it does, for example, give donors some information um, as they think about planning and programming for the future, what types of uh, topics are of concern or of interest or gaps that uh, youth have that could be targeted by donor programs in terms of getting them more engaged. I think the same is true for implementing partners that can help them understand uh, the interest and engagement of youth and communities that they're serving, can help them design better programs. Uh, the data can be used for doing m and &E work, uh, learning work uh, with the donor, with the implementing programs that serve youth. For researchers, uh, we would love to have uh, folks use this data 
The data can be downloaded as Sarah and Jenny noted, but it can also be weighted. It can be, um, there's a number of statistical steps that could be taken to make the data, the raw data itself more representative of the uh, youth, the different youth age groups and um, profile of youth in each of the countries. So there could be more rigorous work done with the data. And then of course, for future work, how do we move forward in making sure that youth are engaged, particularly uh, civically engaged? So a number of ways, again, documented on the dashboard that um, for the use and implications of the survey findings. So I think now we'll move to any uh, Q&A. Um, so as a reminder, if you do have questions, please post them in the Q&A panel and we'll be able to target uh, the different questions to presenters who can address them during this next part of our session. Thanks so much, Audrey. I'm going to now um, hand it over um, to Chris Grady uh, at USA DRG, a senior metrics advisor. And uh, again, at this time, we want to open up to everybody um, that has any questions. I know that there were some um, some more broad questions in the chat that we've already been answered. Um, but uh, I see actually a, a, a question that just came in about um, intention to adapt the online survey to younger youth and adolescents under 18. and um, some questions about differences um, in urban versus rural. So hand it over to Chris and then uh, certainly other uh, team members, uh, Sarah and others, feel free to, to chime in as well on some of the findings as well. Yeah, thanks, Chelsea. Looks like Claire asked, are there intentions to adapt the online survey to younger youth, for instance, adolescents under 18 years old? So I think I'll, I'll open that up. Maybe uh, Nitha, do you have any ideas about that? No, I think it's a great idea. I know Nancy Taggart and I are always talking about, you know, the future and what, you know, we could do, you know, in the next iteration of this. And I know we had a number of conversations about, you know, whether we really wanted to kind of engage that younger demographic in this um, survey, um, but we very much landed on the 18 and above and obviously taking into consideration the consent that would be required. But I do think that there would probably be very interesting data to mine on the under 18 age group. I have to echo a lot of what my colleagues um, and partners and friends in the community are saying in the chat about how it has been illuminating to see family and relatives be such a, a, an influencer in so many of these young people's lives. I have to admit that I really am constantly kind of stopped in terms of the social media and you know online modalities, but I think this has been a great reminder that the people to people connections are important. So I'd be very much curious in the next iteration to look at the under 18 age group. Um, sorry, that was a little bit of a long answer, but I wanted to kind of also share a very interesting takeaway. Does anyone else want to weigh in on doing the survey with uh, youth under 18? I, I think that um, there are definitely some barriers to including youth under 18. Nita mentioned the consent or assent um, issue is definitely one of those, getting that approved, although this is not a high risk survey, it does not ask sensitive questions about behaviors that might be considered um, risky, for example. Um, but, uh, but there's also the, the crowdsourcing methodology requires access to a smartphone. And that is uh, certainly a barrier, not just for youth under 18. It's also a barrier for rural, for poorer, um, uh, respondents. So there, there are definitely limitations in that element of the of the um, of the methodology. That uh, they're, they're, you're going to have coverage problems for sure. We already have some coverage, you know, issues with with the current methodology as well. Great, thanks, Sarah and Nita. We would definitely at YP two LE be super interested in the next iteration, trying to do a younger cohort if we could. We will definitely have to think of the consent issues and any other challenges, but we're definitely open to it and open to looking at um, you know a next set or a next round of ten countries, um, hopefully going forward. Okay, the next the next question that we have is related to urban and rural differences. Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit about the urban and rural differences? Sure. So I, I think Jenny mentioned that the way that the that premises um, crowdsourcing methodology works, they when they bring people in, when they recruit respondents, 
uh, the respondents fill in certain kinds of demographic information. So one of those is their, their status as whether they are urban dwellers, peri-urban, so on the margins of urban areas, or rural. And indeed, with many of the dimensions that we looked at, there is a difference between rural and urban. And I know that Chris and uh, Chris will be doing some additional analyses. I think all of us that are getting our hands on the data are doing some of our own analyses, taking a look to see if there are statistically significant differences on some of these dimensions for the rural versus the urban uh, respondents. So yes, um, I'd encourage you to go to the dashboard after we're all done, uh, go to the dashboard and take a look at some of those, um, some of these questions along the rural, rural urban dimension. All right, I'm going to quick jump in and answer this question from Kelly. Uh, she asks about the global barometer surveys because the Afro barometer captures similar data on perceptions of the issues that we asked about. So she wants to know if we've compared our findings with those. And I think that's one thing that we want to do. And something we did when we were uh, selecting survey questions was to take some questions I, and get them the exact same wording they were on other international surveys that use representative samples at the country level. So we can see how the responses to our survey differ from those. So we haven't gotten there yet to do that comparison, but that's definitely something that we're going to be doing in the coming weeks. So thanks for your question, Kelly. Okay, the, the next question is from um, S. Molina, and it's uh, wondering how we did the incentives. What did the payments look like? Um, and Jenny, maybe you could talk a little bit more about the incentives for folks to participate in the crowdsourcing and whether those are USAID funds or not. Sure. So um, again, it's it's standard practice for any any contributors on the premise app um, to be paid in, an incentive um, for survey data collection. We also have other forms of data collection um, that are kind of more geolocalized or outside of the house. Um, and so incentives differ depending on the level of effort. Um, so for a, a short survey that you can do at home, um, you know, we, we pay a, a small amount. And then again, as I mentioned, um, as we were watching submissions come in from the different countries and across the different gender groups, because um, as you might imagine, in some of these places, it's much harder to get responses from female respondents on a smartphone than it is from, from male respondents. Um, we would adjust this incentives accordingly. Um, and in terms of the, where those funds come from, I think that's just part of, uh, uh, we work on a credit system at Premise. And so uh, working with Premise, you purchase an amount of credits and includes that incentive that is paid out to contributors. Um, for for their time and, and effort to participate in this data collection. All right, thanks, Jenny. Our next question comes from Tahir. He says, thanks for this great work, and then asks, what actually limits the ability to compare findings across countries? And is there any plan to extend this to the survey to future countries in the next iteration to allow for cross-country comparisons? Maybe uh, I'll start with Sarah. Could you start with that one? So I think we've mentioned a few times that um, the samples are designed through this crowdsourcing platform. I don't know that we've got enough information um, to, to comfortably do comparisons across countries. Um, we also did not design it as a, as a cross-country comparison. Um, it, the intention of the survey, no, it's the same survey. It went out to all these different countries. So I think that naturally people will make comparisons. I think that's a, a very, um, I mean, I, I, I would expect that some people just simply will, but the goal here was really to gather information that is a quote unquote snapshot. They're called snapshots for the reason that this is capturing a little point in time with a small, relatively small sample of crowdsourced respondents um, uh, to understand a little bit about civic youth civic engagement um, in a specific country. And the intent was for the country missions. So the USAID teams and their partners in country were to understand a little bit more about their individual country. So for example, program um, implementers, NGOs and so on in Mali might look at the Mali data and be interested in the Mali data, but not necessarily looking at cross country comparisons. I think that a lot of research or some researchers may be interested in particularly in doing the cross country comparisons. If we were to move forward and to, uh, to design this, um, do a little bit of redesign to make this a cross country comparative survey and really a cross national survey, there are a number of different methodological steps that we need to take and potentially changing modes, 
changing um, our sampling strategy as well um, to make this really a very robust cross-country um, comparative uh, study. But I, 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 I would welcome that challenge. I think it would be really useful to have that kind of information to get a more global picture of, of what's going on with youth and their civic engagement. And if I may jump in, um, Audrey and Chris, um, there was a great question from Raymond about the what informed the country selection. And just to kind of uh, give a little insight into that, when we sat down uh, with partners and with USA colleagues, we honed in on four um, uh, points to select the country. Geographic region, we wanted to kind of ensure a balance, uh, a conflict or post-conflict context versus you know, a peaceful context, size of the youth population, and status of freedom for the Freedom House Index. So we tried to kind of ensure that balance to potentially see opening versus closing and the play out in geographic region, but to Sarah's point, this was not designed as a, as a cross country uh, comparison effort, um, but we still wanted to be sort of thoughtful in terms of the selection of countries um, to potentially, when you're looking at the individual country data, to, to see what's happening. I'll add just really quickly about the, the difficulty or the challenge of making the cross country comparisons for the survey is it, since it's not a random sample survey, we can't be sure if differences are due to like an actual difference in how youth in the country think and behave, and just the fact that our sample might be different. So let's say we want to compare Ethiopia and Mali, but in Mali, let's just say like one third of the respondents have college degrees, in Ethiopia, maybe only 10% do. Now I'm making those numbers up, but just imagine that one country has a lot more college uh, educated people in the sample than another country. We can't then be sure if the difference is between like people in the two countries are different, or just the people with college degrees are different. And so, like Sarah said, we need to, to adapt our methodology if we want to make cross-country comparisons. Oh, Jenny, you came off. Uh, did you want to say something about that? No. Oh, sorry. Thanks for your question, Tahir. So I don't see any questions in the Q&A right now, but I had a question I wanted to pose to everybody. So what survey finding most surprised you? You know, what was most unexpected that you saw in the survey results? Maybe you can type it either in the Q&A or in the chat box. All right, I'll type in the chat box. I think we as panelists don't have access to the Q&A. But yeah, Nitha, could, did you come off mute? Did you want to start by saying what about the survey surprised you? Yeah, I wanted to kind of read out some of the great comments that were coming in very early on, um, conversations between Corinne, our wonderful colleague out of the Ethiopia mission, and Mike McCabe, and Nancy, um, really highlighting the role of families, you know, which we talk a lot about as a key component of youth programming strategies, but not sure if we consistently include families in our programs and interventions. I have to say from definitely the DRG Center perspective, I think we can certainly do more in terms of design, in terms of thinking about, again, the engagement of families um, really in a variety of uh, DRG programming, you know, as a part of election programming, as a part of ed programming, like civic ed, etc. It's clear that that has really been illuminating to all of us. And I think there was also a great comment from Corinne as well around, you know, are we really kind of often think of civil society as our prime kind of vehicle for doing a lot of DRG work and probably quite frankly, cross sectorally as well. But again, could we do more with civil society to engage families, relatives, the people to people connections piece of the work? Um, and I think the answer is yes. I think there's always more room for this. And I think obviously it li aligns more with that PYD framework. Um, but I think that was really sort of illuminating. And, um, you know, again, that the, the sources of information was also interesting too as well in terms of where, you know, TV lined up and, 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 and you know, information online. And again, not to, to say that that isn't important, but again, how it stacks up in terms of primary sources was very interesting. So I wanted to kind of highlight that from the, from the chat. So we do have another question that's come in. Um, since conflict was one of the criteria, did we investigate resolution 2256 on youth peace and security by the UN Security Council? Um, Chris, maybe I'll turn that one over to you or Nitha in terms of the country selection. Uh, I'll say we did not, and we did not ask respondents about that resolution. I think asking people about very technical, specific uh, things like, like the UN Security Council resolutions, a lot of people won't know what those are, and so it's difficult to do that in an online survey. I know, Nitha, do you want to add anything? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think you really answered the question, Chris. I mean, in terms of the selection, I think we used um, the Council of Foreign Relations CFR tracker on um, conflict v. non-conflict to kind of select. Um, but yeah, again, as a part of future, future iterations, I mean, that is something to consider, but um, that was not uh, something we factored into uh, the selection process. Um, I did want to highlight um, Mike's um, Mike McCabe's uh, interesting takeaway from the presentation, which is high level of outreach by youth age 21 to 24 to local government authorities. Yeah, great point, Mike. I think that was also very surprising to see, and I think Corinne... Um, had also mentioned this earlier, really surprising to see, I think, the the self-advocacy, but also kind of um, levels of participation that I think were, were a little unexpected. But um, conversely, um, not seeing support for youth participation in local politics, I think it was 35%, again, kind of um, emphasizes, again, the importance of community and people reaching out and reaching out to the people that influence a young person's life, the people. So I um, wanted to highlight that. Got a question in the chat from Jean asking, are there any plans to discuss the findings with groups of young people to engage them in analysis, validation, and recommendations? So do we have any plans to do some in-person uh, qualitative research? We, we don't at this time, but we're certainly exploring uh, possibilities of things that we could do if we were to get additional funding for year three. I don't know, uh, Christy Scott, if you'd like yeah, to say anything I was else. Say in person might be difficult, but um, definitely we could probably do virtual. We'll definitely keep that in um, one of the opportunities to to work with um, youth. Um, if we you know continue to work with the dashboard, I think that's a great idea to be able to engage them in a kind of a virtual format um, and get some feedback. But um, yeah, we'll definitely keep that in mind. I wanted to actually ask a question of Sarah, Chris, or Jenny um, about. Um, online surveying versus in-person surveying in your experience as methodologists and um, what, you know, what you see, I mean, is it a mixed methods approach that's most ideal or is actually online the most effective? I think that would be really helpful to hear a little bit about. I would love to answer this question. So <laughs> over decades now, I've been doing research with a variety of different methodologies, you know, online self-administered, meaning that the respondent answers the questions him or herself, interpreting the question, interpreting the responses and answering them. That could be by paper or could be on, on the web. Um, interviewer um, uh, influenced or interviewer administered questionnaires that could be telephone surveys or that could be um, or that could be an in-person survey. And then also SMS, which is also, uh, SMS surveys are also self-administered. So the first thing that you have to think about is anything that is self-administered that requires reading, you already have an issue with coverage for folks who don't read or don't read well, or don't read the language that the survey is written in very well. So right there, you've got a potential problem. Um, and, and you may have breakoffs, you may have folks who don't participate because that is a barrier for them. So in person or phone uh, provides an opportunity for individuals who can hear a question and formulate a response, but uh, may not be able to do that if it is in a written format. So a phone or a, an in-person survey would be more effective in that way. Another um, big difference between a web survey and a phone survey, phone surveys are relatively inexpensive. They're not as inexpensive as a web survey or a, as an SMS survey, but you get much higher response rates. They can also be longer. Um, social norms indicate that folks who are talking on the phone with someone are not that likely to hang up on them. Um, if someone engages them quickly and tells them the purpose of the survey and tells them how important they are to participate in the survey for these you know, social scientific purposes or for the well-being of a greater group. Um, so you can ask a lot more questions. You can get a lot more detail. You can answer some of the questions that I'm seeing popping up in some of the Q&A here um, because you can ask follow-up questions. You can ask open-ended questions and get a little bit more rich data, uh, Some answer some of the whys, not just the what's. Um, and then in-person can be even longer. Longer. Now, in-person is the most expensive method. So really, I, what I see and over the decades that I've been conducting surveys in lower and middle income country, countries is that cost is driving and a, a desire for lower cost is really driving a lot of the a lot of the mode decisions, mode meaning the, the way that the survey is administered, really driving that. Um, getting a lot more data through 
really cheap methods doesn't necessarily mean you're getting better data. So I just want us to, to caution that um, you can get a lot more data um, and a lot better data in some ways in person, but it is at a higher cost, a higher financial cost. Um, I, Chris, I, I see you nodding and <laughs> um, did you wanna add to that? I think everything you said is spot on. I wanna know just quickly, one of the major differences I see between web surveys and other forms that obviously, um, there's more attention being paid to non-web surveys. More people are just answering the web survey rotely. So there's just a bit more noise, right? It's not systematic, mm -hmm. but there's just kind of a bit, bit more noise mm -hmm. in the survey responses. There's one last thing that I'd like to add to this, which is, uh, again, you know, and, and maybe because I'm a gray hair, I, I, I might say this, um, that in-person surveys and telephone surveys are administered by people in the lower and middle income countries. Web surveys are designed and administered by people in the US and in Europe. And in terms of capacity building, I think that you can't go wrong if you are uh, teaching and training and doing technical assistance with a group of data collectors, with a National Statistics Institute, with a university in a country, say like Benin or Togo or elsewhere, and uh, really uh, teaching survey methods and data collection methods for high quality, you cannot go wrong. If, if, that is, if that's your approach, you're gonna get better data and there's gonna be capacity building involved as well. All that, if anyone's interested in enumerated phone surveys, where you know someone is calling up the response on the phone and administering the survey, the America's Barometer just switched to a new, uh, phone surveys because of COVID, and they put out a really excellent methodology paper on what they learned doing that. So I'll throw that link in the chat so others can read it. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else want to respond about um, the difference between the different modalities? Yeah, I'll just say this from experience working um, both on, on this project and several others that include kind of multi-country survey data collection. Um, I, I do think that what it offers is, is, is a snapshot of the current, um, of what's currently going on on the ground. Um, and it can be deployed quickly and be iterated on um, kind of in real time across, in this case, 10 countries. We've done it across 76 countries at a time. Um, so that's what I do think it can offer. But yeah, I won't. I will <laughs> definitely not argue that the, the the quality of the data, the comprehensiveness of the data, um, is is similar to an in-person numeric survey or, or a phone survey. But I think it can. What it can provide, it's it's an additional tool in the toolbox. So it can provide again a snapshot, a signal, kind of a, a sentinel system of, of what's happening on the ground. So we have a number of questions coming in again. Um, so perhaps we can start, Brian is asking um, just a very specific question about why engagement with officials is super high in Mali as opposed to all of the other countries. I don't know, Chris and Sarah, since, or um, I think Arena also, since you're so immersed in the data, was there anything just from looking at the data that might explain that? I have not taken a specific look at that, and I don't know if Chris or Arena has, but that's a good question. I think we can, we could, I mean, I imagine that Chris is gonna be digging into that soon. Yeah, my yeah. first thought is that the sample in Mali might just be a bit different. Like the type of person mm -hmm. who's answering the survey is probably different. So we can look and see if the average education level or something in Mali is higher. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't done a specific deep dive into the demographics of the respondents in each country. I know, Arena, did you, did you wanna say anything about that? I don't know if you've looked into it yet. Yeah, and Nina hasn't. Yeah, I just wanted to add and just kind of confirming with our wonderful group here of um, uh, methodologists. I, I, to me, I get the sense again, just re-emphasizing that because it's a snapshot in time, what we also could be seeing is that the political context in Mali or certain types uh, has lent itself to maybe a greater interest levels, greater um, maybe efficacy um, uh, on the side of civil society or youth-led efforts. But again, it would be great. Um, I don't know in you know future iterations. I don't know if key informant interviews. This is where you know you can do a bit of follow up and dig in. But yeah, it again it gets back to you know questions really about the sample versus also you know a snapshot in time. But I, it was it was very interesting to see kind of Molly pull out um, as a bit of the outlier. And I know we've got some um, you know uh, sort of regional specialists attending today. So please do use the chat like Kelly Burke and others. Um, who can jump in. 
because we've got another some other questions coming in as Audrey said. So Hilda asked about measuring completeness. So because completeness in itself has a lot to say. So out of the seven thousand participants, did any how many fully completed the survey, and did any not fully fully complete the survey? You have to complete the survey in order to submit it on the premise app. So you have to at least go through every single question and press submit. So there, there isn't the option. You can exit out of the survey, but it wouldn't count as a submission. All right. Thanks, Jenny. So yeah, no partial submissions. And J Jenny, since we have you um, off mute, um, someone is asking whether respondents were given a choice of languages on the web survey. Um, the premise app will match to the language that your phone is set in um, as a default setting. Um, so that is what the, the marketplace of tasks will appear in, but you can also go into the, um, your account settings and change the language um, that you want all tasks to appear in. So, so yes, they are given a choice. And then maybe you can also um, answer how many fraud bounce backs did we get? I will have to get, I'd have to <laughs> look into that. Um, I know that the data was provided to YP2LE as kind of the, the complete data set. Um, but I don't know the exact number off the, off the top of my head. Well, I, can, we'll, the, I was looking at that. It was, uh, it was about 74 respondents out of the 7,000. So just under, what is that, 0 0.9, 0.09%. Mm -hmm. Maybe then, yeah, Jenny, I mean, could you tell us a bit more about how uh, the premise app determines that a survey is fraudulent or not fraudulent? Um, yeah, I'd say that, again, um, we have a couple of parameters that every submission is kind of uh, scanned for. We have a kind of mock GPS or emulator check, um, and that is to ensure that, you know, someone isn't in, you know, the U.S. responding to surveys in Mali. <laughs> which it, it happens. Um, and uh, so yeah, if they're, if they're phone, we were able to tell if their phone has a, a mock GPS or an emulator um, program turned on uh, and those are discarded. Uh, we have a certain threshold for um, time for completion of the survey. And so if they complete it like way faster than is normal, we can uh, assume that that is not a you know quality response. Um, again, as I mentioned, uh, button smashing or pattern matching, meaning they, just select the first response on every question. Um, and um, th those are all removed from uh, the survey. And then we can also tell if they're submitting from multiple countries or they have multiple uh, premise accounts on their phone. You know, if someone, um, we, we ensure that, you know, every person only has one premise account on their, on their smartphone or device. Um, and that way you can know that you're getting one response from, you know, one survey, one response. Um, in the sample. And so yes, if we detect any of that, um, we'll filter their submission out of the data set. And if it's a violation of our terms of service, which having multiple accounts is, um, as well as using an emulator, then they're suspended from the platform. And then Andre, I think there's one last question left from Ajit that you want to tackle and then... Yes, um, I was actually going to... Uh, ask Maria to answer that one. Maria, someone is asking uh, where the best place to find case studies related to the role of families and people um, is on the website. So perhaps you have a, a quick, uh, there is a search function on the website, but Maria, maybe you know which, um, which header under the, the website is the best one to find that information. Yes, so um, you can uh, uh, filter, like when you use the search, you can then filter the results by different types of uh, tags that, that the content has. And so one of them would be, for example, case studies. So you can filter for case studies first. And then, yes, you can look at the different, uh, so the next category would be sectors. And so uh, you would then look at uh, 
for example, DRG as one of the first, uh, so democracy, human rights and, and governance. And then underneath that, you will be able to find different uh, attributes. You may also be able to find some uh, filters under youth specific aspects. So depending on what exactly it is that you want to look for, those are uh, certain ways in which you can then filter it down to the specific case studies that you may be interested in. And feel free to, if you can't find something, feel free to just send a message to info at youthpower.org and we'll be happy to uh, respond. And also if there are any other questions or if you have any problems with accessing uh, the, uh, uh, the dashboard, uh, please also send a message to that info, and I will type it in also, info at youthpower.org, and just put in the subject line that it's about the, dash, the civic engagement dashboard, and we'll either answer it directly or we will make sure it goes to the uh, appropriate experts who can answer your question. Thanks so much, Maria. I just want to briefly chime in as we wrap up some of the discussion questions. I'm gonna we're gonna be launching a poll just to get some initial feedback from you all. So as we um, continue to answer any remaining questions and and talk about um, next steps, um, if you can please complete the poll, we greatly appreciate your feedback on how to improve our dashboard and user experience. So do we have any more questions, anything else, anything, any details, additional details that we could provide related to any of the findings? Tahir asked a question about the future voting behavior that both Audrey, you and I both answered a little bit there. So the question or the comment that Tahir made was what surprised me is that more youth intend to go out to vote or are planning to vote uh, than, than had voted before. And Audrey, you're correct that uh, folks that said they didn't vote before, some of them may have been too young to vote uh, and or you know too young to vote in the last election, the last major election in their in their uh, country. Um, but there's also potentially some bias there. Uh, future voting behavior is commonly, I mean, think about it, uh, a, a survey done in any country, um, almost always when people are asked, oh, do you plan to vote? Uh, people see this as, as reflecting well on themselves. If they say, yes, I plan on voting because I am engaged civically and I am a, you know, a responsible citizen and so on, I'm planning on voting. So there tends to be an inflation of the future behavior. I'm mean, sure at the moment they absolutely intend to, but then the actual behavior you capture when you ask, did you actually vote? Or you look, and even that, sometimes there's an inflation of, yes, I did vote when in fact maybe somebody didn't quite, they got in line and then decided not to. So there, um, there's always there's always some some slippage. There's some error. There's some just respondent behavior. Um, people respond to questions in in different ways. Some of these over the decades and decades and decades that survey researchers have been looking at responses and analyzing responses. Some things are somewhat predictable, um, or at least we know that there's some margin of either error or inflation or bias, et cetera, in responses. And then it rains on election day, and <laughs> exactly, and and then there's a pandemic, and yeah. Yeah, and I just kind of wanted to help sort of conclude this session by tying it to our DRG learning agenda at USAID. You know, a number of the questions that were raised, like the voting questions and some of the comments, really, um, you know, point to some thinking and, and quite frankly, priorities around how do we um, increase youth participation and engagement even beyond an electoral cycle. And even the interest in voting and the act of voting, how do we capitalize uh, on that and engage civil society to bring young people into the sort of larger um, participation and long-term participation in civic and political life. Um, and just kind of really to close out, you know, one of the things that was really exciting about this snapshots activity was we really, you know, hope to help us understand and address, you know, questions in the DRG learning agenda focused on participation and inclusion. For example, what strategies result in the participation becoming habitual what are the most effective civic engagement participation strategies for maintaining and creating political space in restrictive environments, including closing spaces and violent affected societies, et cetera. But I certainly feel that there are many takeaways from this dashboard 
and, and an opportunity here that anytime we're looking at a specific country and noting, you know, for now we have these 10 countries to look and to figure out how some of this data can inform our thinking around design, um, around implementation and being mindful of, you know, the various, um, you know, again, people who can influence a person's life, being mindful of certain attitudes and behaviors and how certain motivations um, and, and, and barriers can impact, sorry, attitude and beliefs. And so um, that's really what's been the most exciting um, part of this entire uh, process um, and, and study. So I just wanted to say a huge thank you to the YP2LE partners, to Premise, um, to the Center for Education, Nancy, uh, and our DRG colleagues, Chris, who also were able to really um, do something exciting with the study by, by integrating this priming experiment so we can learn a bit more. There are certainly a lot of ideas that came out of this in terms of looking ahead to the future. It's great to see so much interest in expanding this mm -hmm. and all the other different things that we would want to do um, to dig in a bit more um, as we better understand some of uh, what we're trying to answer as a part of our, you know, not just the DRG learning agenda, uh, but some uh, broader questions we have, you know, obviously at, at the agency and in the sort of DRG space. Um, and development. So I will wrap there. Thank you so much. Audrey, over to you. Yeah, I'll just add briefly that I think, um, you know, the work also really has done a lot to contribute to our positive youth development learning agenda. Uh, I think really understanding, even if it's a snapshot, how youth are thinking about voting and different civic engagement behaviors. I think a lot of the comments and questions that have come up uh, related to understanding more about the why we got certain responses, um, you know, we're going to be looking to see what might what we might be able to contribute in the coming year, and that may be more related to you know not only repeating the survey but possibly having more qualitative data to understand responses. So I think following this uh, the launch of this dashboard, we'll be revisiting um, how we can continue to contribute both to the measurement aspects of youth engagement and understanding uh, meaningful youth engagement. So I'll turn it over to uh, Chelsea for contact information and then Nancy and Christy, if you have any final words. Thanks so much, Audrey and all, and, uh, and to the team um, for, for sharing that comprehensive overview and, and for everybody's great questions. Uh, I think as, as everybody has noted, I think that this is a conversation that we're hoping continues as we continue to um, draw from our learnings and think about opportunities to collect additional data um, in the future years of YPTLE. So uh, we really welcome um, your, your feedback and your questions about this activity. Uh, you can reach out to Audrey uh, uh, Moore, who is our lead technical advisor for YPTLE and myself. I'm a research evaluation and learning manager for YP Charlie, and that includes any feedback on the dashboard as well. So please, um, I know you've all shared some initial feedback in the poll today as you've uh, begun playing around with our interactive website. But if you have additional feedback, we certainly want to make sure that this is a tool that is um, accessible uh, to a broad uh, variety of stakeholders and audiences. So we truly do welcome your feedback and appreciate it. Um, anything you have to share. Um, so please reach out at any time um, with any feedback. And with that, um, I am gonna just hand it over to um, uh, Christy Scott, our project director, and Nancy Taggart, our COR, um, for any concluding remarks. And again, thank you all so much for your time and participation in today's event. Yeah, thank you, Chelsea. So just wanna say thank you to everyone for participating and hope you dig into the dashboards and we really look forward to your feedback of improvements and anything else that might make it even more useful to you. And really a huge thank you to Amita and Chris and everyone at Mathematica and our partners um, with YP2LE and to USAID for all of their support as we um, really went forward with this dashboard. It's been a great effort and a great partnership. So we um, thank everyone. We look forward to the next iteration and continuing to move this forward. Anything from you, Nancy, as we- Yeah, just two plugs. Um, stay tuned for um, another uh, variation on this presentation where we're gonna be engaging young people at um, the upcoming uh, Positive Youth Development uh, Summit. 
uh, targeting USAID uh, staff in particular. Uh, that will be in November. And then, you know, to all missions uh, who are still on the call and other USAID operating units, if this uh, really resonated with you, this tool really speaks to interests that you have and priorities, let me know because um, it's really important to be aware of that as we're prioritizing activities for next year and, and allocating funding and so forth. So I'd love to hear from you um, about if, if you haven't made a comment already. Thanks a lot. And thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.